accordion is honored today to be able to present Howard, sorry, Harvard psychologist, Professor Howard Gardner to parents and visitors at the school. CIS prides itself on being a community of learners. Because of this, we are constantly seeking to improve upon what we offer our students at our school. Yes, we ensure that our students learn to speak, read and write, two of the most widely spoken languages this century. Yes, we are concerned that our students, who are largely Thai, are able to speak, read and write their very own language. This will help equip them for the future, and through language, they will also better understand their own and other cultures. Yes, we have chosen to use the three programs of the International Baccalaureate because we believe strongly that they offer a first-class education for our students, guiding teachers to present learning in a variety of interesting and highly effective ways. But most importantly, our mission and that of the IBOs care deeply about what kind of young person we send out into the world, what qualities they possess, what sense of honor and duty they carry forward. Our mission talks about nurturing, integrity, and dignity in our young people. It talks about our students possessing a strong sense of moral and social responsibility. But more than that, it states that our students should not stand by when, uh, where others do, where there is a need. They should be proactive and wherever possible, aim to make a difference, a better difference to this world. This gentleman beside me has done just that. Not only is he a truly sincere and humble man, he is a lifelong learner, with his ultimate aim being to improve upon the world, to improve upon the lives of others. His research work on multiple intelligence and more recently leadership and ethics has had wide-ranging effects on young and old in education, the world of business, and medicine. Kunvani and I have met him now on several occasions. Our staff at CIS have had the pleasure of meeting him this week. And indeed, after today, I know that you, our very special group of parents, will join with us in saying that this man is a good man and he does good work. Thank you, Professor Dyer. Thank you very much. This is on? Yes. Yeah. Thank you, Nadine. That's a very warm, gracious introduction. I hope I can live up to it. <laughs> I hope you can all hear me. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. I don't speak very loudly. I have a cold. So. Yes. I think this is better. Yes. Okay. And thank you very much to Kumbarni for inviting me to spend a week here in Bangkok. It's about halfway through that week. I arrived on Sunday from Manila, where I had spent a week. And on Monday, I spent a very full day with the teachers. Talked about five hours. <laughs> and yesterday, I spent an equally full day walking around school. I think I probably saw most of the, most of your children because I visited about 15 classes. And I expect to continue visiting the 
in the school today and tomorrow. And then on Friday, I will speak to the business community. And on Saturday, as many of you know, I'll be speaking to the educational community, particularly international schools. There was an expectation that I would give a formal hour long lecture today. And I apologize if you have that expectation. But I decided that anything I could lecture, you could read. You could read in English, you could read it in Chinese. I don't know if you could read it in Thai. I thought instead that I would make some remarks about the school, what I've observed so far, just one day. Then talk about multiple intelligences, which is the advertising talk. But only speak for 15 or 20 minutes, and then we can use the rest of the time for questions, comments, discussion. So I hope that as I'm speaking, you'll be thinking about issues that you want to raise. It could be issues about multiple intelligences, but I'm happy to talk with you about educational reform in other countries, about new findings in biology and psychology, which pertain to learning, the questions you might have about ethical, moral issues with your children, or about the pros and cons of three languages, and how important the accent is or isn't. Um, and anything else that you bring up, I don't promise to have an answer, but I will take your question seriously and try to, try to be helpful. So, if I'm not through talking by 9 o'clock, I will simply stop myself. So we have a good hour for discussion. As for the school, I had a very good experience with the teachers. I think they are very impressive. They come from many different backgrounds. Many, if not most, have lived in different countries. And this makes for a very cosmopolitan, very multicultural, very diverse kind of experience for the children and particularly because they are exposed not just to one teacher, but to many teachers over the course of their attendance here. The teachers are very comfortable with the students. I was worried that I could find classrooms where everybody was very stressed, because it's stressful to have to learn three languages, three scripts, in addition to other parts of the curriculum, but I found the classes were comfortable. The children were at ease. It was joking and smiling with the teacher. This doesn't mean there was no learning going on. In fact, often the best learning happens when you're comfortable and playful and not when you're overstressed. I think you know that when you're overstressed, mostly you feel bad and uh, you make mistakes because you're not in control. Of course, I couldn't monitor the teaching in Thai and Chinese because I don't speak those languages. But I saw the children listening and participating actively in their language classes. And for the most part, when class was in Chinese, they seemed to be speaking Chinese. And when the class was in English, I know they were speaking English. Not always, but for the most part. And that's important because we don't want the students just to be comfortable in Thai. We want them to be able to switch comfortably from one language in one context to another. 
And it's no surprise, it's the easiest for the young students. Because the three languages are more like three birth languages rather than one birth language with two other ones being grafted or pasted upon. Now, I happen to be a big supporter of the IB, of the International Baccalaureate. I've known about this program for many years. I've worked informally with the IB. I think some of my ideas are part of the IB, though they didn't get them for me, necessarily. And I think for youngsters growing up in the 21st century, it's probably the best international curriculum by far. So I'm an enthusiast of the IB, and certainly the IB ideas and concepts and practices are very much woven in, into the practice of the, the classes that I saw. Probably the most impressive thing I saw was in a class where I think it was uh, grade two. Um, where the students had been studying magnets for some period. This must be one of the ID inquiry themes. And the actual classroom teacher wasn't there. I think she had food poisoning. So there was a substitute teacher from the Philippines. And often when there's a substitute teacher there, that's an excuse to fool around, have fun, and not work. Also, the students had not been in the class for over a week because of the Chinese New Year. Anyway, the students were asked to create a game using round and square magnets. And the game had to have rules. The rules had to be understood by other people who weren't there when the rules were made. And the magnet game had to reflect what they'd learned about magnets why the magnets um, are directed to the North Pole, what happens when you put the same or symmetrical sides of the magnets together as opposed to the positive, negative magnetized uh, poles together, and then actually build the game and play it. And this struck me as being an impossible assignment, much too difficult for second graders. I wouldn't have known what to do. Um, but in the course of a half an hour, the children were in four groups, and they each went right to work in trying to develop a game. And uh, the, pro the progress, particularly of uh, two tables which I focused on, was quite amazing. And to do this, the students had to remember what they'd learned about magnets from before the holiday. They had to think in terms of a game, a game that you can set the rules out, a game that takes advantage of how magnets work or don't work, and a game that somebody else can learn. And even the fact that the students were asked to do this, it's a very demanding assignment, was impressive. But what was more impressive the students made a lot of progress in the half an hour or so that I observed. So I took this as a very healthy sign. Now I know that some of you, like some of us up here, when we went to school, the emphasis was very much on just learning lots of facts and being able to remember them and give them back to the teacher. And, a test. and there's nothing wrong with that, except the more time you spend memorizing facts, the less time there is to do anything else. And nowadays, most of us carry around some kind of device 
where we have all the facts stored, we can just look them up. And so it's not a good use of time to memorize all the Thai kings when you can just have a list and look them up. You should know the five most important ones and perhaps you can make them available. But it's really not necessary. I use the U.S. presidents to know all the U.S. presidents. Most of them didn't do very much. What you can do with an IB kind of curriculum is get young people to think for themselves, to ask new questions, to figure out how to answer those questions. Things which aren't already in the encyclopedia or the Palm Pilot or your, your pocket computer. So I think that while what's happening in the school may be new to many of you, you can have my assurance that it's the best kind of education for the 21st century, whereas education with just lots of memorization is a 19th century, maybe early 20th century kind of education. So those are comments about um, what I observed in one day, just one day, but it was a very full day. What I want to do now, and I'll stand up, is to talk a bit about what brought me here, which is my ideas about multiple intelligences. I'm a psychologist by training, and one of the most famous inventions of psychology is the IQ test, where you ask people some questions, and the questions are supposed to tell you how smart people are. And the IQ test isn't evil, um, and it, it's not worthless, but I became convinced 25 years ago that it's a very thin, narrow, distorted picture of the human intellect. And so using the most contemporary disciplines, genetics, brain study, anthropology, psychology, the study of prodigies, people who are outstanding in something, or autistic children who may be very impaired in certain areas, but not in others. I came up with a new theory of intelligence called multiple intelligence theory. And as the name indicates, I believe, and other people also believe, there isn't just one intelligence which can be measured by an IQ test, but that all of us have several different kinds of intelligence. They're like several different computers inside our head. So the old view is there's one computer, we might call it an IQ computer, and some people have a high IQ, so they should be able to do everything. And some people have an average IQ, so they should be average in everything. And some people have a low IQ, and so they should be poor in everything. In fact, though, as you get to study people and understand them, you see that most of us have jagged profiles. That means we're good in some things, average in others, and not very good in other things. And especially once you go outside of school and you look at all the different jobs that people have, all the different hobbies that they have, and you begin to look at different cultures and what they value, and you begin to look at history, what was valued 5,000 years ago, 500 years ago, when your grandparents went to school, when your grandchildren go to school, you see that there isn't just one kind of intelligence, there are many. So, this whiteboard lists the eight or nine intelligences. And everybody has all of these intelligences. We have them all. But no two people have exactly the same strengths and weaknesses. Not even identical twins. Not even triplets. Somebody here has triplets, right? In the school. So what are the intelligences? I'm going to first just mention them and then I'll say a few words about them. Linguistic intelligence that allows us, of course, to learn languages. Logical mathematical intelligence. The intelligence of a scientist, 
computer program like mathematician, spatial intelligence, a navigator, a sculptor, a chess player, taxi drivers, taxi drivers need to have a lot of spatial intelligence, especially if they want to find shortcuts navigating Bangkok in the morning. Um, musical intelligence, of course, that's like language, except music is a different kind of language. Bodily kinesthetic intelligence is using your whole body or parts of your body to make things or to solve problems. It's not just moving your body, it's just moving your body, but it's dancing or athletics or crafts or surgery. Those are all involved bodily intelligence. The sixth intelligence is naturalist intelligence. That's the intelligence which allows us to distinguish one plant from another, one animal from another, one cloud from another. Then there are two kinds of intelligence having to do with human beings. Interpersonal intelligence is understanding other people. And of course, that's very important in teaching, clinical work, business, politics. Intrapersonal intelligence is understanding yourself, having a good model of who you are, what your strengths are, what you're trying to achieve. In a school like this, I would imagine a lot of intrapersonal intelligence is developed because the students meet teachers who have very different backgrounds. They're not all born, raised in Thailand. And they learn about different languages and different cultures. And all of that gives them some distance from themselves. You know, they say, the fish is the last to discover that it's in water, right? Because the fish is completely surrounded by water. Well, when children are in a very homogenized environment, where everybody has exactly the same background, knows the same things, you don't have any distance from yourself. But in the global world now, where we are connected with people around the planet, and anybody in business has to meet people from different countries, different cultures, um, you need to know yourself, you need to understand other people. So those are the personal intelligences. And there might be a ninth intelligence, which I call the existential intelligence. That's a big word. Of course, in Thailand, all the words are long words. Um, existential means the intelligence of big questions. Why are we born? Why do we live in this world? Why do people kill, them, kill one another? What happens when you die? Why do we die? Those are existential questions. There might be an intelligence which um, is that kind of intelligence, but I have a very strict set of criteria for what counts as an intelligence, and I'm not sure. So that's why I put a question mark here, and that's why 8.5 intelligences. There might be eight, there might be more than it. Now, you notice that two of these intelligences have to do with human beings. The other ones um, are more dealing with the, the physical world. Um, let, me, let me say that better. Two of the intelligences are really focused on us as human beings, understanding other people, understanding ourselves. And that's different from the other intelligences, which involve human beings, but you can do them more alone. You don't need for musical intelligence, you can just listen to music or sing, you don't have to relate to other people. Language and logic, I mentioned the first, because those are the intelligences which are most important in school, especially in what I call a Western school. And this school, even though we're in Asia, is basically a Western school. We could talk about what I mean by that. And the IQ test is a pretty good predictor of how people will do in a Western school. If you have a high IQ, you will probably have an easier time in school than if you have a low 
IQ. If we wanted to say what is the target top, what is the ideal of somebody who has a strong language and strong logic intelligence, it would be a professor of law. Because law is an area where you need to be very good with language and very logical. A poet can be very good with language, it doesn't have to be logical at all. A computer programmer can be very logical, it doesn't have to be good with language, just with computer language. But law professors really combine language and logic. If the only purpose of school was to pick out law professors, then the IQ test would be a very good test. But most of us are not law professors, don't want to be law professors. You couldn't have a society filled with law professors, right? Um, and so we're using a very narrow slice of intelligence if we only focus on language and logic. Though in school, language and logic are important. Nobody would deny that. So I just wanted to say one more thing and then open it up for discussion. <clears throat> Let's say that I'm right. And instead of having one computer and one intelligence in our skull, we have eight or nine different computers. And everybody has got all those computers, but no two people, not even twins, have exactly the same strengths and weaknesses. We could ignore that and say, well, even though people have different kinds of minds, let's treat them exactly the same. And let's teach them in the same way. And let's test them in the same way. And basically, that's what's happening in most of education. But I think it's very unfair. It's very unfair. Because it's really directing education to the language logic mind, the future law professor mind. And the more you're like a law professor, the easier school will be. And the less you're like a law professor, the more difficult school will be. So, when people take the idea of multiple intelligences, the idea I just gave you, and try to apply it in school, there are three things which they usually do. First of all, they individualize. That means instead of teaching all the children exactly the same way, they teach the children who learn better one way differently than they teach children who learn better in another way. Now you are very, very fortunate because your children are in a school where the classes are very small. So it is possible to individualize. I understand in many schools here, there are 40 or even 60 children in a class, and there might not be a teaching assistant. It's much more difficult to individualize under those circumstances. Also, some of you have tutors for your children. And of course, tutors can individualize a great deal because they just have one student. Number two, even if you can't individualize, you can still teach what you're teaching in many different ways. So, if you're teaching yesterday in Peter Stanley's class, they were teaching, I think they're called linear equations. Does that sound right? Um, and they have a smart board. A smart board is nice to teach with a smart board. But um, what they did was they put a child on a little chair and pushed the child around at different speeds, and the children had to grab where the cart, where the, where the, where the chair was at each point on the, from the push over here, say, to the end of the gym. And then they recorded the distance and the time, and they created a linear equation. Now, my guess is most children who were in that class will remember that lesson because it was pretty dramatic. Um, but um, that's not the only way to teach linear equations. Maybe it'd be the first time it was ever taught that way. I don't know. But when you teach things in lots of different ways, you reach more children. Because some children learn better from 
looking at a smart board, and some children learn better from reading a textbook, and some children learn better from making a magnet game, and some children learn better from being pushed in a cart and having to record um, where the cart was at each, at, at each point of you know, measuring the rod. So in addition to individualizing, you can also teach something from many, in many different ways. And when, you, when you're doing that, and this is the final point I want to make, when you teach in lots of different ways, you develop what we call different mental representations of the same topic. What that means is your mind-brain performs a lot of different You might say a lot of a lot of different slices of that particular topic. So let's make this concrete. If you think about something that you know well, let's say city of the city of Bangkok. You can think of Bangkok in lots of different ways. You can write about it. You can explain how it's constructed different uh, regions. You can have a motoric representation because you're driven through the city. You can look at a map, a very schematic map, a very detailed map. Um, you can, um, if you're artistic, you can create a painting about Bangkok, the area of Bangkok. Those are what we call different representations of Bangkok. And the more representations you have, and the more you can connect those representations, the richer your understanding is of Bangkok. No, I don't think that, <clears throat> sorry. Children are taught about Bangkok, probably not necessary. But if you're taught about things I saw in school, about democracy, or about magnets, or about linear equations, the more different ways you can think about that, the more understanding you have. And it's when you can connect all of those different slices, those different representations, those different images, that's a good word, those different schemes, then you really have a good understanding. Which is the reason that when you try to cover too much material, children don't have any understanding. Because you're going so fast from one thing to the next that you can't develop a rich representation. The things that each of you remember from school are not the things that five minutes were spent on. It's things that people came back to over and over again in lots of different ways. So, let me summarize. I went a little bit longer than I had thought. I'm here on a week's visit. My second trip to Thailand, but the first was as a tourist over 30 years ago, so my memory is pretty thin. Um, and I've had a chance to meet with the teachers who I am impressed with, and to see your students in many different classes. And I think the students are having a very good, rich experience here. Um, if there's stress, I don't see it. Uh, you may want to talk about the stress that you see, and I'm happy to address that. The classes seem comfortable, not hurry, um, and the youngsters seem to be engaged. And, um, in fact, in the class where the teacher was sick, um, the substitute teacher didn't have to watch very carefully. The kids sort of went on their own to work on the magnet project. And I was watching uh, children at recess yesterday. And there, were no, there was no need to monitor them. They were taking care of themselves very well. So that I have a good feeling about the school based on one day's visit here. And I think the IB is the best curriculum for an internationally oriented school. It really is put together <clears throat> very thoughtfully. And it really takes into account not what you need in the 19th and 20th century, but what you need in the 21st century. And even though I came here to talk about many things with the teachers, um, I focused the day on multiple intelligences. This is probably a new idea for many of you. So you shouldn't accept it right away, uh, but I hope you'll think about it. And uh, it certainly has lots of implications for teaching. And I know some of you will ask me about implications for parenting as well. So let me sit down and have you open it up for discussion. When I 
I first um, developed this theory, I developed it as a psychologist. And I kind of thought that most of the positive and negative remarks would be by psychologists. But in fact, psychologists have never liked that theory very much. Um, biologists like it better. And this is kind of biologically based. But the people who became interested in it were educators. And the first people who became interested in it were what we call special educators, who would deal with children who have learning problems. And that's because every day they see youngsters who have a lot of trouble with one thing, but not necessarily trouble with other things. So a child might have a lot of trouble with reading or spelling, but no particular trouble with math or with science. So, the theory of multiple intelligences gives you a way of understanding what the problem might be with a learning, with a child with learning problems, learning difficulties. But more, and the big changes over the last 25 years is we can recognize reading problems much earlier, often by the age of two or three, and even perhaps in, in, after birth, because there's evidence now that there's certain areas of the brain which are not developing for people who be dyslexic. Now, that doesn't mean we should take six-week-olds or six-month-olds and teach them to read. That's ridiculous. But there are things one can do, like working on rhyming or what they call separating out the speech sound so it is over and the child can hear the difference between ball and hall. It's hard to hear, especially if you are at risk of dyslexia. My guess is in 50 years, we will have early warning signs for many learning problems. And then, if we have good teaching methods, to use the other channels or to strengthen the weakening channels, then some learning problems will go away. Um, the other thing to say with learning problems is computers can be a great help because computers can allow you to do in front of you, so to speak, what other people can do inside your head. So, for example, I'm not very spatial, so it's difficult for me to manipulate a cube in my head. But if I can put it on a computer screen and manipulate there, I'm at the same level as somebody who doesn't need the computer screen. I happen to be quite musical, so if I hear a few, I can see what happens to the theme over the course of the few. But if I wasn't, with a computer, I could record it and play it as often as I want, as slowly as I want. I could take voices apart, and I could do with the computer what other people do in their heads. So, between a better understanding of the brain better understanding of how to teach, and the use of, of we call them prosthetics, aids like a computer, some of those learning problems can be much reduced. Recently I had one question for myself. Is, uh, I think they're going to pass the microphone. You need a prosthetic, right? Recently it came to my mind that uh, it's a very big difference nowadays uh, in how children develop. When I see in my home country, uh, how much time children spend learning and playing with computers, it changed the way they, they live entirely, if I compare with the pre-computer area. How do you think this will affect all this intelligence? Well, actually, I have a friend, he's a well-known scientist named Antonio Batro from Argentina, and he's written a whole book called Digital Intelligence, because he claims that nowadays what we are cultivating is people who are good at digital kinds of things like computers. Um, I don't actually agree with him. I think that digital is just a variant of logical mathematical. And we certainly had digital minds before we had computers. But you're asking a different question. You're saying, are we producing a different species of child um, because children spend so much time in the digital world? That's what you're asking? Yeah, I, 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 I'm not sure, but I think I see that. I think I noticed that they uh, lose a lot of social skills, for instance. 
because uh, a lot of these children, they spend time with a computer, not communicating with other children, not playing with other children, so not developing lots of stuff that I developed when I were young. Yeah. Well, um, I, have a few, I have a few reactions to that. Uh, first of all, as you know, computers can be used for just about anything. Um, I mean, my 19-year-old my son spends his days decent messaging, which is, of course, a very social kind of thing to do. And uh, when he's not instant messaging, he's on his cell phone, which is also a very social kind of thing to do. I guess what I would say is for parents, um, you need to monitor your child to make sure he doesn't spend too much time doing any one thing. And when he's doing that thing, you ought to know what it is that he's doing with that thing. So, to be more concrete, I think it's fine for children to watch an hour or so of television a day. It's even better if you know what they're watching and you watch with them so you can talk with them about it. Um, I think it's perfectly fine for a child to spend an hour a day with a computer, but it's better if you know what he's doing and you shouldn't be going to pornographic sites, which is something you can do nowadays. If your child is spending three or four hours a day watching television or three or four hours a day with a computer, I would be concerned about that. But I'm probably be concerned if they were spending three or four hours every day uh, playing basketball, because life isn't just basketball. Mm -hmm. um, when people talk about how computers are changing um, young people, I think we have to be cautious because the species is pretty robust, and you know we probably haven't changed all that much in 10,000 years. But the kind of thing I would be looking out for is number one taking on artificial identities. We have many young people now who pretend to be somebody else on the computer or pretend to be many different people. And I think that can be a risky kind of thing. They can get trapped into, they can trap other people or they can get trapped themselves into schemes. I think that when you surf the web, it's very different than doing things in a linear kind of way. It's very, Poly connection, poly network. And this may make it more difficult to follow um, the kind of arguments you have in a sustained text, let's say a philosophical text, where somebody introduces premises and then uh, makes inferences in those premises and then critiques them. I think that may be more difficult for a mind that's very much on, in, the, in the web kind of world. Um, there is some evidence that. Children who play computer games a lot are somewhat better at spatial tasks. But you have to say, if you're spending too much time on computer games, they're probably going to be worse on some other things. This might be include the social realm. I mean, if you're busy killing people on the computer for four hours a day, which more than one of my sons has done, that's, you know, that's four hours you're not spent doing other things. So, in short, I think it's important to monitor what's being done. And I think if too much of one thing is being done, it's not a good thing. And if too much of one thing is done, it might change your, the biases of your intelligence. You might become more spatial, less interpersonal. But I don't think it's going to happen in most cases, because happily people do get bored. And it is boring to spend four hours in front of a computer for most people. They, they want to go get a cup of coffee or play ball with their friends or read a book or do something. Thank you. So down here, yes. Uh, since you said, uh, since you said uh, each one was born with different intelligence of what you were doing, what is the intelligence? How do you measure each one? How much do you have? And um, how is the school to help and encourage each one of them? Uh, do you think the ID is working with the type of ID? Okay, there's a number of questions packed in there. Um, first of all, um, I should emphasize that at any one time, if we could take a photograph of your mind, we could say which intelligences are stronger than which other ones. But that will change. It will change because people decide to focus on one thing rather than the other. I mean, if you're if my spatial intelligence isn't very good, but I decided I really want to develop that, 
and I'm highly motivated, and I have good teachers, I might eventually be able to find my way around Bangkok in a taxi without a map. So you can get better on an intelligence if you work at it. Uh, so that's, that's the first point. The second point is that many people have developed tests for the intelligences. Um, I, don't, I don't particularly recommend most of them because they confuse an interest with an ability. Um, and people are better able to report what they find interesting than they are at what they're good at. So you might love to listen to music, but that doesn't mean you have a lot of musical intelligence. If I want to know whether you have musical intelligence, I'll teach you a new song and see how good you can learn it. Or I'll introduce you to an instrument and see if you can figure out how it works. Those would be a better way of, of, of assessing your intelligences. I say that if you really want to know about your own intelligences, think about what you're good at and what you learn easily. And then ask two other people who know you, a friend and a relative, the same question about you. And if they all agree that you, I don't know your name, are really very linguistic, then probably you are. But if one says yes, the other says no, then you need to think about it further. Um, in the classes here for the young children, they have learning corners, you know, where kids can go and do different kinds of things. Watching children, you know, in the music area, in the block area, in the role play area, I saw a drama class yesterday. Um, that's the way you see what the child, children are good at without having to do a formal test. By the way, um, a number I couldn't quite see the point of, but then I realized that these kids didn't know each other, they were different grades, and they were, she wanted them to be comfortable. And then each pair of children was asked to um, act out, essentially pantomime, um, a different role. One was, you know, you're being, you have some very heavy helium balloons, and you're being pulled by the balloons. Um, and another one was, you're walking, your shoes are very tight, and how do you walk with very tight shoes? Another one was, you're a detective, and you don't want the person to see that you're following them, so you have to have no idea. There were over a hundred books about multiple intelligences, Chinese. Uh, I also I just came from the Philippines and I was very surprised how much interest there was there. So I couldn't understand why in China should there be so much interest in multiple intelligences. So I asked many people and the best answer was given to me by a journalist in Shanghai. He said, Dr. Gardner, in America people are interested in multiple intelligences because they want to know what's special about their child. They want to find their child's genes. Like your child is very bodily kinesthetic and very spatial. And they thought, how can you make that child into a great ballerina? That's the American interest. She said, in China, the intelligences are just eight things we have to make our kids good at. So our kids have to be all good at music, all good in bodily kinesthetic, all good in spatial. So it was a very, very different reading of the theory. In the Philippines, I discovered a totally different reason for the interest. It doesn't have to do with the child's genius. It doesn't have to do with eight things we want our children to be excellent at. It has to do with trying to break the mold of traditional education. The education there is very old-fashioned, and it doesn't speak to the contemporary era. And the Philippines is falling further and further behind in other countries. So the interest in multiple intelligence is less an interest in um, teaching to the multiple intelligences, and more an interest in challenging the old ideas about how education should work. Now, I don't know how much interest there is here in Thailand in multiple intelligences. I'll see that probably on Saturday. And even if I can find a lot of interest, I don't know whether you are more like the Philippines, or like China, or like the United States, whether the interest here is, is, even, is even of a different sort. I know that Barney was interested in my ideas in part because of my interest in ethics morals in her own feeling that Thailand is deficient in the moral component of learning more, product, more important adult professionals. In Philippines, they did something very interesting, which maybe you might want to emulate here. In the Philippines, remember, multiple intelligence is very well known in the Philippines. At the school I visited, they gave awards to eight very well-known public figures. 
each one was outstanding in a different intelligence. But it also used that intelligence for public good. So there was a composer who spent the time working with poor children in a poor neighborhood, teaching them instruments. Um, and, and, a, and a scientist who was working to save the environment. He's a very famous scientist and one of the most important international award. And they gave the interpersonal award to um, Corazon Aquino, who of course is a politician, was a politician, and is interpersonally intelligent, but um, is seen as having been very positive, both when she was the president of the Philippines, and now she has a foundation which focuses on education for children. So this was a way of combining multiple intelligences with the ethical dimension. And of course, you can talk about ethics and morality all the time, but that doesn't make people ethical and moral. People are ethical and moral because they are impressed about they are impressed by people around them who behave in an ethical or moral way. Um, at Varney's behest, I'm speaking to business people on Friday about ethics. Lecturing those people about ethics isn't going to do any good. They could give a lecture themselves. I need to help them think about why is it that some businesses, some countries are more ethical than others. What's the difference? Uh, and if they're interested, then maybe they can learn from those examples. Uh, Chinese youngsters took moral education every day when they were students in Maoist China. This didn't prevent them when the more cultural revolution came from killing their teachers and their parents. So lectures don't do it. It's a, it's a much more common. I can shout as well. Um, I'd like to follow up on one of the things you said, that um, you can develop the different intelligences. Now, by that, you're implying that IQ is not fixed. Do you believe that uh, IQ is fixed from, basically fixed from birth, or each of these intelligences can be developed? Okay, well, just a little terminological clarification. Um, IQ is the name of a particular psychological construct which we nowadays secure from giving people a test. But people hope someday to be able to measure IQ, this particular psychological construct, through brain waves or even through gene chips. And you will see in the newspapers and in magazines, we have found the brain area for IQ, we have found the gene for IQ. Now, brain area in the gene changes every year, so obviously they haven't found it yet, but that's one kind of enterprise. If you ask about, can IQ be changed? And I'm sticking now with the psychologist's definition of IQ. The answer is that it's difficult to change in the individual, though if you work very hard, the kinds of skills which are tested in an IQ test can be improved. However, the IQ around the world has gone up 15 points in 50 years. That is astonishing. Nobody would ever have dreamt that, that was possible. 15 points is the white-black difference in America, so it's massive. What that means is that whites in 1950 performed exactly like blacks in 2000, except that whites also went up 15 points. So the question is, why can IQ go up 15 points? And there, there's debate. Some people say it's nutrition. I think it's schooling. I think the IQ test is basically a test of how you do in school. And so the more time you spend in school, the more school smart you become. And that's why IQ goes up. Now, the question you're asking, I believe, is if you look at these eight intelligences, how changeable are they? And I think the answer is, Every intelligence has a heritable component. Again, that's a technical term. What it means is some of your intellectual potential comes from who your biological parents are. Uh, however, on the average, um, no, that's hardly ever more than 0.5. So even for IQ, which is quite heritable, or height, well, let's, let's stick with IQ, Still, about half of your IQ is determined by non-heritable, non-parental factors. My own guess is, if you look at these seven or eight or nine intelligences, 
they would differ on how arrogant they are. So I would assume, for example, interpersonal intelligence is not very arrogant. What that means is knowing how good your parents were with other people isn't going to predict how good you'll be. Interpersonal, I would think there would be no prediction whatsoever. I think when it comes to musical, it's probably pretty arrogant. However, you can take any ordinary group of people and make them much more intelligent than anyone in my intelligence is, if you make that a priority. And the example I used the other day with the teachers was a method of teaching violin playing in Japan called the Suzuki method, or the talent education method. This is a method which was devised about 50 years ago by a man named Shinichi Suzuki. And the first time people like me saw the children who played the violin with the Suzuki method, we thought they were all geniuses, because their little five-year-old kids were playing Mozart and Sherry. But when we studied it, we realized that children were not geniuses at all. They were perfectly ordinary children. The genius was Suzuki, because he figured out how to take little children and their mothers, usually their mothers, and create a environment which makes children very, very useful. So my guess is that any intelligence that we wanted to develop in children, if we made that a very high priority, thought a lot about how to teach it, um, motivated people, that intelligence would get to be much better. This school is an experiment in the development of linguistic intelligence. It's an experiment. Um, because there are very few schools in the history of the world which have tried to teach young children three different languages using three different scripts. I have no doubt that the children who go through this school will have a lot more linguistic intelligence in learning new languages and other language things than people who are, say, in America, where they hardly ever learn any language well enough to use it unless they go to that country. So, to put that another way, if we took your children when they were age three, and we compared them to a bunch of American kids, age three, on language ability, we would find no difference. If we went back to them 15 years later and looked at the language ability, I'm sure that they would look much more linguistically intelligent than the American kids on the average. So we have to hope the experiment works. Good. Yeah, I mean, there's two points there. Yeah. Um, one is, uh, developing people to their potential and the other one is increasing their potential. I think you know you need to be very clear between those two two areas. That's a very good question. It's not one which um, which I could answer. Um, in fact, to be honest with you, it may be a question which couldn't even be answered in theory. Uh, I mean, I can think of animal studies which might cast <coughs> some light on that. But I can't think of how we could possibly distinguish between just getting people to realize more of their potential versus actually increasing their potential. Now there was someone there was someone down here. John. Is it John? Yes, one thing is Bill Moore. That I didn't ask uh all the next two minutes. Uh what is good is clear separation between what they taught here in religion versus the religious group. Then we can ask some question, especially and asking questions that this group should not ask. Do you believe that this is low in religion in a school like this? And do you think that they may teach something, especially for the intelligence that a school like this is missing? Okay, that's a rich question. Um, when I talked to the teachers the other day, I actually had a slide which said spiritual intelligence with an X through it. Because many people thought there was a spiritual intelligence. And indeed, some people said, I had said that there was a spiritual intelligence. Um, and I did a study of this, and I concluded that what, what people call spirituality is not an intelligence. However, that there's an aspect of spirituality which might be an intelligence, namely this interest in big questions. So, I'm going to substitute the word religious for the word spiritual. 
I don't believe there's a religious intelligence. It would take too long to go through the criteria, but I have reasons for saying that. Oh, I'm sorry. John asked uh, basically, is there a religious intelligence and what should we do about religion in this school? Is that that's your question? Yeah. Okay. Um, so I, I was saying that I don't think there's religious intelligence, but I think religion may well be a response to a existential intelligence because human beings are conscious and we can look at the world around us and we can ask, why is it this way? Where do we come from? What's going to happen to us? What is love? No other animal asks that question. You can be sure your, your dog and cat, no matter how smart they are, they don't, they don't ponder those questions. So I think it may well be a existential intelligence. Religion is one answer to that question. I mean, many people here would be Buddhists, Buddhists have one set of answers to the question about what happens when you die, reincarnation. Um, Christians think you go to heaven or to hell. I'm a Jew, I don't know what Jews think happens. We're pretty much involved in what's happening here now. Um, so religions are answers to those kinds of questions. Um, my own background as an American secular, secularist, secularist means somebody who believes there should be a division between the religious sphere and the political or worldly sphere. Um, I'm not very, I'm not comfortable with religion being taught in public schools. And in fact, in the United States, as you know, by law, religion is not supposed to be taught in the schools, though that law is being chipped away as we speak. Um, of course, people can go to denominational schools. You can go to a Catholic school or a Jewish school. And usually you pay to go to those schools because they're not government schools. And there you can have 